You sent me your best edit to react to, so let's see if they're good or bad. Now, if I sound a little bit, you know, weird, that's because uh, this past week I've had a little sickness going on, so yeah, it hasn't been fun. But enough talk about that, let's go ahead and get straight into the reaction. I handpicked a few to look at, and let's watch. Jim bloody <laughs> Kerry. Throughout the night, Jim Carrey absolutely dominated Hollywood. And your boy Jim went from a homeless college dropout. And a lot of people don't know this, but when I was about 14 or 15, my father lost his job, and I actually became homeless for quite some time. Into the highest paid actor. Already, I like the music. See, Jim Carrey achieved everything that he ever wanted. Ascending to the heights of success, fame, and wealth, he realized that deep down he felt empty. It feels like Mask a out. low level of despair. You live in. I wanted to find the most meaningless thing that I could come to and join, and here I am. I, you know, all those guys. This is the Jim Carrey story. Okay, so that was a pretty good intro. I actually liked that a lot. I liked the music a lot, and the tension was there, and it was cut at a pretty good pace, and there's a few moments of pausing and some contrast there. So overall, I mean, that was pretty good. A little strange tonight, and I'm not sure why. Uh, so we're going to start this story just Music at the change. moment that Jim Carrey blew up into fame. And that would be at age 19 in 1981. So Jim Carrey grew up in Canada, and he'd done a bunch of stand-up sets, but he was never very successful. But it would be at age 19 where Jim Carrey would open for a rock band. All right, so just a little constructive criticism. Something, a small detail that I noticed is wherever he says... Uh, 1981. At age 19 in 1981. You put a typing sound effect, but the text fades in. To flow a little bit better with the sound effect, I would have put the numbers with the clicking, like it was being typed in. But it's just a small little detail, uh, just a little constructive thought I had. So Jim Carrey grew up in Canada and he'd done a bunch of stand-up sets, but he was never very successful. But it would be at age 19 where Jim Carrey would open for a rock band called Godot. So Jim Carrey walks on stage and stares at a crowd of very straight Masked face, out. all black, long hair rock fans, and he tries to do his comedy. Music change. Obviously, it was pretty brutal. But that would all change in April of 1982. After this photo of him appeared in the Toronto Star, with a picture of him doing an impression of Sammy Davis Jr. Right on, man. <laughs> but it's Trudeau. That's pretty good. Man, I didn't know you guys had it like that. I didn't know you guys edited like that. That's pretty good. You have the newspaper animation with the shadow behind it. Yeah. And then the video fades in. But it's Trudeau. With the highlight. Despite bombing in front of audiences, there were people that were starting to notice that this man had some talent. Something was unique about him, and he started to appear on front pages and articles of different magazines. With one in particular saying, Jim Carrey prepares for fame. He just has this unbelievable charisma, this highlight. incredible energy and aura around him. But you see, on top of this, there was something else. There's been a lot of music change here, which I enjoy. Uh, obviously not too much, but the music change is right and it keeps you interested in the video when it changes like this for specific moments and what's being said. Else that was very unique about Jim Carrey, and that was his ability to do impressions. His name is Jim Carrey. He's an impressionist. Here's his unique brand of comedy, Jim Carrey. Word had spread of this weird Canadian man whose face could morph and completely transform into someone else. One of the early videos that you'll see of Jim Carrey is an evening at the improv. It was in 1981. And this is where we'd see him do some of his famous characters. One being Sammy Davis Jr. And another being Tom Jones. And so in 1983, Jim Carrey would have his first ever appearance on national television. This young man is a young impressionist from Toronto and a little bit different. And that would be on The Carson Show. He walks on stage and you can kind of feel that the audience is a little bit apprehensive. Hello. Music fits. My name is Jim Definitely. Carrey. I'd like to do some impressions for you tonight, if you'll just give me a minute. His ability to completely change his face is quite a unique one. Well, there was one place where Jim Carrey discovered this strange, unique gift. And that place was the mirror. You know, I think I've probably spent my entire life staring in the mirror 
They have. It's like, you there's see, pauses up, Jim for Carey focus. Was a loner. You know, he wasn't the most social guy. He didn't have a lot of friends. So I guess one day he was so bored, he just looked in the mirror and started making faces. You know, like kids do. Jim Carrey once said that I spent most of my time in the room staring at the mirror. I never knew I was supposed to socialize. I just spent hours making faces at myself, having a good time. And I'm at exact. That's the exact effect I was talking about for typing it out. I guess it was just a small little thing. Uh, but you gotta hear. See, Jim Carrey's father was originally an accountant. You know, he had a decent job, they had a home. However, very sadly, he lost his job and in turn, he ended up losing the home. And a lot of people don't know this, but, uh, but when I was about 14 or 15, my father lost his job and I actually became homeless for quite some time. At just age 16, Jim Carrey had to drop out of school because effectively he needed to look after his family. And this was a very dark time for Jim Carrey. So something I would have done there, it going black here to a black screen was a little abrupt. I would have maybe held on it and you did it earlier in the video. So I would have added some reverb to the end of it and maybe slowed it down or held on the clip a little bit and then gone into the other one instead of it just cutting really fast and then going straight to the other one. So it's not as abrupt, but homeless for quite some time. Right, so I would have held the clip a little bit more and let it transition better into the other music and pacing of the video. I can get 2,000 people down and I will still be saying to the world that those people are more interesting than me. It's just not true, you know? So you threw your act out. I threw it out. Before we continue with this video, I want to give a massive shout out to today's... See, reverb just like that. Which, see, so that was good because it was like a kind of a riser to it and then it just cut. His friends thought he was crazy, but he went back into the comedy clubs and started over doing improv. And of course, very often, he bombs. People screaming at me Tracked to do to his my face. old act and, or getting actually violent. It was a crazy experiment, but it was so good because it made me comfortable with the creative process. I could just fire out and hit him right now. <laughs> And so with this new attitude and new vision, Jim Carrey would enter the decade that would change everything, the 90s. Oh my God, what happened? In 1990, Jim Carrey would appear in a show called In Living Color. In Living Color really showed Jim Carrey's actual abilities, his abilities beyond just doing impressions, but his skill for embodying and embracing a character and transforming himself entirely. Rest your neck. She tried so hard. And so by this point in the 90s, Jim Carrey had a very, very reasonable portfolio behind him. And it was just a matter of time before he would get his big break. And there would be one year in particular that everything would change. 1994. One more thing, Lieutenant. I don't know how he did it, but in one year, the boy had three box hit Bumpers. February 4th, Ace Ventura. July 29th, The Mask. December 16th, Dumb and Dumber. I don't know what happened in 1994, but the Chinese calendar had it down as the year of Jim Carrey. These films grossed over $700 million. The world had finally seen exactly what Jim Carrey was capable of. Very quickly, the title of the $20 million man started floating around Hollywood. You laugh that way because you know you're wealthy. Is that very wealthy? And that, that's, that's, odd. that's how wealthy people laugh. I wouldn't have been. Oh! <laughs> the truth. Truman Show. Tell me what's happening! Well, you're having a nervous breakdown. That's what's happening. Through the 90s and into the 2000s, Jim Carrey continued to dominate the film industry. He appeared in endless classics and made tons of characters that will no doubt be remembered forever. You're ready. You're ready. But behind the scenes, there had become a very deep rift in Jim Carrey's life. It feels like a low level of despair. You live in. And he wanted to answer this deep question inside of himself of why does he always need to be seen, heard, and loved by other people? Why is why is he so needy for that feeling? How's life? Everything good? You know, it's it's so beautiful. It really is, especially when I'm absent from it. And by the 2010s, Jim Carrey's presence on the big screen had definitely There's definitely a lot of black screens when it comes to transitioning into other areas. <laughs> Um, but the music, I really like the music selection on this one and it's cut pretty well 
Yeah, it's pretty good. His insights were surprisingly very deep. And he would talk about lots of things, but sometimes he would go at Hollywood, celebrity, and stardom. There'd be an article in August 15th, 2018, where he really criticized Hollywood, saying, I just don't want to be in the business anymore. I didn't like what was happening. The corporation's okay. taking over and all of that. Got a orientation rotating with the highlight. And these days, the film industry has a lot Scrolling more down. pressure on it. Every film needs to be very successful. And that box can become small and confining. And for Jim Carrey, it doesn't really work. A lot of his films that came out in the 90s were very risky. He was a new actor on the scene. You know, he was untested. These days, that would be way too much of a risk to pump all that money into something that we don't know is going to work. It's much better that we make Fast and Furious 74. But it really does seem that he's found some kind of peace. I have enough. I've done enough. I am enough. And with that, I will say good morning. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. If you enjoyed this, please join us. Okay. Yeah, that was pretty good. I didn't, uh, the music selection was pretty good. Everything was cut in order to show you information and take you through a journey. And the only small critique i guess i would have is some transitions into other pieces of music and stuff like that seemed a little forced it was a little abrupt transitioning into other sections that's the only thing pretty much for the type of video it is and now i do understand in an editing aspect the person you're working with and making and editing the video is going to want different styles and different stuff. I mean, they'll add things and stuff like that. So I do understand that, but the overall video, good job. Okay, next one. We're here at the world's largest retro gaming expo in Portland, Oregon. Today, we might finally find a game we've been dreaming of for years. Watch as Leo finally snags that awesome Japanese Sega Saturn game he's been chasing. Nick's in a thrilling bargaining match for some super rare Nintendo GameCube games. All of these great finds and more are happening right here, right now. Welcome, Punch! Nick spotted Pokemon X. Okay, very high energy coming into this one. We got some highlights around certain things and a lot of, I can already tell the style of this edit. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Let's continue. See for the GameCube at a low price. Good deal or not, he's checking with Isaac. Let's see what he decides. Buy Pokemon XD, because this guy said he'll sell it to me for 140 without the manual. 140 without the manual? And it goes for 200. It's XD? One. XD, that's worth it 100%. I would just check the disc, obviously. Yeah. Um, how good is the case? I mean, for 140, I don't even know why I'm asking. That's a good deal, yeah. dude. Just do it. Is it a good game, though? Like, yeah, I, I play yeah, Coliseum. I mean, it's different than Pokemon. You're not going to go to gyms. It's more like an RPG where you dungeon crawl. How comparable is it to Coliseum? It's like the same thing. They're like the same. I'd recommend getting it. I'm going to try to bundle it. OK, there's some sound design here, and there's just little things here and there. I uh, don't think I didn't notice the music change, because I did. And there's other sound effects and stuff like that. So. Doing pretty good on that. Because he has Pikmin also. The first you got one. the He's asking, graphic up here in the right corner. For both. Yeah, if you could swing both, I'd try. It doesn't hurt to always like ask vendors if they'll do, you know, multiple games and maybe they'll shave some money off. But yeah. I think you should do that, dude. All right, I'll go, dude. I saw you also have Pikmin. Yeah. Um, I was thinking maybe now, potentially. Now, one thing that myself probably wouldn't use is the way the captioning is right now. The way it's, uh, you know, fading in like that, and then the animation. Um, I think there's other ways to make it stand out and pop a little bit more to see the captions uh, other than that. Both of those, based on what you've mentioned, um, would you consider 190 for both? Uh, let's grab one. Let's see. I get a 200. Yeah, that works. Awesome. Let me get, let me get that for you. 
I um, ended up getting both of these games right now. I got Pokemon XD Yellow Darkness. He had it for 175 and he said he would go down to 140. He doesn't have the manual, but I know it's a pretty sought after game, so I went for it. He also had the first Pikmin. I know you can get these on the Switch these days, but I kind of like getting the games on the original console. I did 200 all together. I'm pretty happy about it. Both of these first party titles have been ones I've been wanting to get for quite a while, so I'm pretty happy about that. Oh man. I think it'll work though. Uh, if, if I know correctly, don't they read from here yeah. going out? I could always go to a game if you can test it. Huh? Yeah, I would definitely at least ask if you could test it. Because that is a big purchase. Yeah. Okay, so I've seen this same clip about 10 different times uh, and it's starting to cut a bit fast. One thing that I am noticing and obviously I'm going to watch the whole video, but there's no, the cutting and everything is really fast all the time, even in the parts that's supposed to build tension uh, from what I've noticed. So the, the pacing is always the same. And if it stays the same, it gets a little bit too repetitive, if that makes sense. Uh, but the graphics are there and it is, it does seem to be a little bit cut off right here, uh, for this graphic. And they showed this twice and maybe just holding on, holding on some of these shots just a little bit more. Uh, instead of moving super quick, because then you're like, you know, what am I supposed to look at? Nick got some great GameCube games to add to his collection and haggled his way to save some money. I just got word that Leo might have found something interesting. Let's go catch up with Leo. I finally found something. Meet Leo. Okay, He's on so. The for two Sega Saturn classics. Will his quest be a success? Let's dive in with Leo and see. I found other stuff. I went to a booth and they had Saturn Bomberman fight for the Sega Saturn. That is a Bomberman game where it plays more like an isometric game where it's a fighter. It's one-on-one -on -one and you kind of set up these bombs and you KO each other by taking off hit points off the bar. And it looks really fun. I've been looking for that for years. It's not an expensive game. It's one that I've never found in person. So I'm finally glad that I found it in person. I'm gonna get it right now. I was looking at that Saturn Bomberman again. I was wondering if you'd be willing to do 20 on it because I noticed there's some water damage on the label. Are you comfortable with that? No? Uh, sticking to it? 25? No? No, I think 30 is pretty fair. Think so? I do. All right, so you take card. I finally got this game. I paid $30 on it. I was hoping to get a little bit cheaper, but that's fine because I've been looking for this for a little while and it's one that for some reason this is the only booth that had it out of everybody. There were some Saturn games that were American, some Japanese ones, but this is the only one that had this specific game, so I'm happy. I like the pop-ups at the bottom a little bit cheaper, that so show the... Leo just scored Saturn Bomberman. A classic what it is. Line. Meanwhile, over with Sam, he's got his eyes on Kirby Plant. So I see what they're doing here. They're having a whole timeline or they have it mapped out of what's going to happen with everything you know with the question marks which is a gives it a little bit more of a interest and it robobot let's see if it's his next great addition meet sam he's on the lookout at the portland retro gaming expo for some unique additions to his gaming collection i'm trying to get this kirby planet robobot okay, yeah, i had two of them though the other one i already got oh it's sweet yeah i love that game going around in a mech suit as kirby is yeah amazing. it's like kirby mega man yeah it's one of the games i'm trying to get on the list 40 bones there you go brother thank you appreciate it so your boy got kirby planet robobot i've been recently playing the kirby game now that i'm spending most of my time editing the videos and shooting them the way that i've heard it be described from nick it's basically mega man but cute and kirby so i'm gonna play the heck out of this and 40 bones shout out to the purchase can't beat that dude 40 you can't no That's store price. yeah pretty much yeah and i think this game's gonna go up in price shout out i think so hey wait i might not have brought the game uh -oh. I left it in the hotel room. It's all good. Yeah, we'll come back tomorrow. Yeah, I didn't bring it. Hey, don't do be like that sometimes. I lied. But good to know. Yeah, I'll go ahead and come back tomorrow. The comedic right, pauses are, <laughs> are good. It, the game. <laughs> Leo is thrilled with Die Hard Arcade. Now over to Nick. He spots a GameCube game he's been eyeing for a while. Will he snag it? Let's watch. Here, Nick spots Alien Hominid for the Nintendo GameCube, a game he's been wanting for a while. It's a little steeper than I would want to pay for it. He sees that it's a little. 
I wonder how much, I wonder how they recorded this. If there's people with everybody else, like if there were individual, there was a cameraman for each person. That's what I'm trying to say. If so, there was probably a good bit of footage to handle and deal with to make this it video. Looks expensive for his taste. Let's see if he can get it for cheaper. And it's, you, you have it listed for 75. Uh, this one right here. Would you be willing to do 60 on it? It's custom to look like full. Hi. It's at 75. Would you do 60? Sure. So, so I got this game called Alien Hominid. It's on other systems, but I played this game growing up with my cousin. It was originally on it's consistent it effects a showing game, the. And ported it to GameCube and PS2 item. and stuff like that. It's kind of like a Metal Slug clone, but with like aliens. And if you ever play like Castle Crashers or Battle Block Theater, it's in the same people who made that game. So, been wanting it for quite a while. Happy it got. To purchase your Sonic the Hedgehog. Thirty-five. All right, there you are. Happy birthday, Nick! You're getting Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, no problem. Oh yeah, no problem, dude. Wasn't it your birthday like last week? Thank you. Here you are, Nick. I watched this show a lot growing up. At the time, there was two Sonic shows. Comedic, com comedic pauses are pretty good in this. One was more serious, and this one was more kind of goofy and lighthearted. It came on Disney Channel mostly when I watched it, and had a lot of fond memories of it. So I appreciate Leo getting it for me. Sonic says, "Watch the Game Boys." <laughs> Way past cool. Appreciate it, Leo. <laughs> yeah, no problem, dude. You found it, no, Nick? it's a different one. Probably oh. get this one for her, too. Ooh, con everything I say is constructive, all right? I'm not, I'm not trying to bring anybody down. I'm trying to help you out. This slow-mo section probably wasn't needed because I get, I get what you're trying to do there and make it a little bit emotional. Uh, but then you slapped on a subscribe right over it, which kind of takes your attention away a little bit from what's actually happening. And the frame rate's not there, so the slow-mo's a bit choppy. Then there's confetti with happy birthday. You found it, Nick? No, it's Nick's looking at these common games. They got a deal where it's 50% off of games, $20 and under. Okay, and checked on, held, Seven circle. Buckaroonies. Be like three bucks. It's good. So like three, six, eight, eight. eight. It's, I think it's a nine. Two. This is the world's largest video game controller. It was set up and there was a line of people trying to play Super Mario Bros on it. Hey yo, what's going on here? It looks like these people are playing Mario on the NES with this huge controller. Check this out. A homie's laying down on it. It looked like it required what? a team of people to actually play together on the controller since it was so big. <laughs> Here, Nick stumbles across some games he's been looking for for a while. Can he get them at a good price? Looks like both of the games are complete in box. Last day, kind of laying low, bro. I'm surprised more people didn't ask, like, do you bundle more? I was like, hey, if you buy more, I'll bundle more. You know? Right, yeah. A lot of confetti. Let's see, you get a chance to live in the life of a rock angel. Nick and Sam have found a GameCube and it's on. They're facing each other as Super Smash Bros. I No! That's how you do it, oh, yo, boy. Oh. All right, guys, you're already here at the end of the video. You might as well smash the like or not. I'm not going to force you, but thanks for stopping by. Okay, uh, definitely a high energy video. I can tell the creativity is there. There's definitely unique styles that's trying to be implemented in here. Obviously, it's about games, so there's a lot of that with the sound design and all of the, you know, the graphics and stuff. But I think everything could be a little bit more cleaned up. I noticed, like I said, 
some transitioning into music and stuff like that. And some of the graphics, uh, there's just a few sections that could be cleaned up, uh, a good bit, but there was a lot of graphics and there was a lot of outline glow, uh, you know, stuff that not everyone can do. So, okay. I have people living in my house. I don't know who they are, where they came from. Doors are gone. The kitchen has been gutted and they won't leave. They won't leave. The term squatter is a very controversial one. Freeloading criminals who break into people's homes, stealing them and leaving them in terrible conditions. But the history behind this strange subculture is a very unique one, challenging many moral and cultural attitudes. This is our home. It can be used for home. In today's video, we will explore the hated world of of squatters. No longer will there be the so-called squatters right. First, the extraordinary standoff between a homeowner and a squatter. It's Julie's house, it's in her name, and she pays the mortgage. But for more than two years, Teresa Smith has been living there, slowly destroying it. Now, growing up in the UK, I seem to constantly recall hearing stories of squatters. Like every other week, there'd be some news article about how squatters broke into someone's holiday home, which would then be followed by these lengthy court battles where they tried to evict them out of the property. And it seemed as if the law was on the side of the squatters as opposed to the property owners. Some masking here behind the, you got a mask going through the key with the animation of it moving, obviously. Yeah, it's pretty good. And music selection is pretty good as well. And in some cases, actually granting the property to the squatter. So if okay. you sat there wondering That's who good. came up with this genius law, well, this is all due to a thing known as squatter's rights, which the UK law states that a long-term squatter can become the registered owner of a property or land they've occupied without the owner's permission. Now, squatters exist all around the world, but I'm gonna mainly focus on the UK, where- This is only one of many ex-army camps taken over by the thousands of ordinary, hard-working folk who haven't a place they can call their own. And it all starts Whoa. in medieval England. In a time where British nobles would be fighting over various Music, massive yep. plots of land, it became pretty tricky to keep on top of the paperwork. There's purpose like which with British the music selection. What bit of land. And because these plots of lands were so big, there would be certain areas that would be known as common land. This was land that was kind of left for the common folk. Like they didn't okay. have direct ownership. Outline. Outline with the orientation. Moving. The glow. Got the people like, highlighted but they areas. They didn't have direct ownership of the land, but they were allowed to use it. But you see, this presented a problem. All right, so let's put it like this. Imagine you're a family that has been on a plot of land for about three or four generations. And then one day you wake up to a knock on the door to find some great, 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 great grandson of a British noble wiggling some papers in your face saying that one of his great ancestors owned this land once upon a time. He then proceeds to tell your whole community to get off this property now, and you don't... I was, I was so, I was watching the video. I didn't even realize I'm supposed to be looking at the editing, but this is pretty good. One day you wake up to a knock on the door to find some telling great, a story. Great, great, great the door opens of with the animation of his no arm moving up and down. In your face saying that one of his great ancestors owned this land once upon a time. He then proceeds That's good. to tell your whole community to get off this property now and you don't really have. And then his mouth moves. Have a legal leg to yeah. stand on. And so squatters rights started with the intention of trying to stop this situation. These families would occupy these derelict buildings in a kind of legal gray area, staying there all the way up until the mid 1950s. It was estimated across okay. Britain there was 45,000 squatters. And like what they were doing technically wasn't legal, but none of the political parties wanted to be known as the party that evicted war heroes onto the street. And so many of these squatting camps actually received funding from the government, with the left seeing it as a case for public housing, and the right seeing it as a batten down the hatches, take matters 
hands into your own hands kind of attitude. Squatters in this era were well received by the press and publicly celebrated as an expression of English patriotism. At the other end of the scale, hundreds of homeless London families take matters into their own hands in a new squatters invasion. When in reality, it was just people trying not to live on the streets. But then the goodwill towards squatters would change very quickly. Toward the end of the 60s and into the 70s, a brand new, even more radical era of squatting would begin with the hippie movement. These large squats would open specifically to get media attention. With a mansion on 144 Piccadilly in central London, the Ill Pie Island Hotel, the Centrepoint Building, okay. and Freestonia, a new radicalist wave of squatters had formed, who were actually creating a rift between the original squatters who were mainly families trying to just get some housing whereby now these radicalist squatters weren't ex-military families. They were more so young single people and were all pretty much self-proclaimed hippie dropouts. The public had sympathy for the genuine homeless, but not for the scroungers and hellraisers who infiltrated nice. 144 overshadowing the like a newspaper of the typing in and doing them a disservice. They also didn't <laughs> I'm saying that like the people watching this wouldn't even know what that is. I'm saying that the graphic is good. It's All right. You might be there wondering why couldn't police just come in and evict them for trespassing? Well, you see, in the UK, trespass is a civil offence and not a criminal one. In order for police to be able to evict squatters, you would need to take them to a court to get permission from a judge to get the police to kick them out. And this process could take months and cost tons of money. And what's even more shocking is there would be cases of people actually losing their homes to squatters legally. Whereby somehow in British law, if you've spent 10 to 12 years squatting a property you now had a legal case for ownership of that property don't think i don't notice the highlighter of sound effects nice if you focus in a little bit you'll hear the now highlighter had a legal case for ownership of that property. This is the country I live in. By the late 2000s, the public the little things. was growing so much against squatting that someone would need to come along and do something. In steps, Mike Weatherly. I think there is there are two types of squatters. Some are just like anarchists who don't care about other people's property, and uh, I think those should be held to account. A British Conservative MP for Hove in East Sussex, Mike made it his life's mission to get rid of squatters' rights. And so around the early 2010s... So I probably would have used a different photo that doesn't have this cut off right here. Whether that's zoom... Uh, no, it would probably fill in too much of the screen. Uh, just one that doesn't have it so cut off or maybe fade around it. That's the only thing Definitely. with this. I think there is there are two types of squatters. Some are just that who don't care about other people's property. And uh, I think those should be held to account. A British Conservative MP for Hove in East Sussex. Mike made it his life's mission to get rid of squatters' rights. And so around the early 2010s, a war had started between the MPs and squatters. There was a fierce battle and protesters were going after Mike. But squatters were really going against the tide. No one was on the side of squatters. And so eventually in September 2012, a law was passed making it illegal to squat Sounds in residential it. properties. In that same year, Alex Hay became the first ever convicted squatter, facing 12 okay. years in prison. It was finally over. The plague of squatters- Got a little graphic here going on. The image that was being portrayed of squatters was that of a criminal freeloader. But was that entirely true? Mike Weatherly himself recognized that there are two types of squatters. There are some, some are just like anarchists who don't care about other people's property. Where he would make the distinction between the anarchist freeloading type. And there are others that are in need and we should absolutely get behind them and help them in their in their plight. But then also people driven into squatting by poverty. And there's certainly- Again, music selection is good for this. Whether it's right to have buildings unoccupied for many years at a time when there's people who are living on the streets who could be living in them. As it stands right now, Section 6, otherwise known as Squatters Rights, still applies to commercial properties, which I think there is more of an argument for. If you have an office block that hasn't been used for seven or eight years, I don't really think it's a bad thing that homeless people can go and live in there. She could look through the window and all her mother's possessions were being ripped up and her embroidery thrown around and, and everything was being destroyed and they couldn't do anything about it. And uh, they broke down in tears in front of me and said, this might, this cannot be right. 
and it took them, I think, 10 weeks and £13,000 to get their property back. But the thing that I and the rest of the British public hated was the idea of going into residential property. It was very wrong, and it's very good that that is now over. I think it is very important not to stereotype a squatter and just see them as drug-taking hippies, and understand that there are many other circumstances that might be being a squatter. I'd be very curious to hear you guys' thoughts on squatting, whether you think it's right or wrong. So comment below, leave a like on this video, and subscribe to the channel and watch this video right here. That's good. Told the story. There was actually a few effects in there that I was like, hey, what's going on here? In a good way. <laughs> but yeah, there wasn't too much there that I would critique if I was being really picky uh, as far as helping, you know, make it look a little bit cleaner and a little bit better is as far as the movement goes, some of the graphics, the movement seemed a little unnatural. Uh, like if somebody, if something was sliding in, it seemed a little bit unnatural instead of, it was like a linear instead of it being, you know, having some speed to it. But besides that, the overall video was pretty good. It told the story. And on YouTube, I saw that it has a good, a lot of views. All right, that will be all for today. If you want me to react to your edit, you can just send it and I'll check it out.